All right, welcome back. So we'll start with this example where we have the position function 7t plus 4, and we want to know the average velocity on the time interval from time equals 2 to time equals 3. So we know that the average velocity is equal to the change in position divided by the change in time. So what we'll do is we'll plug each of these values of time into our position function, find the difference between them, and then find a difference between our time, because that would be the change in time. And what I described earlier is our change in position. So let's do that. We'll have that this is equal to the position at time three minus the position at time two divided by three minus two, which is time equals three minus time equals two. So this is our change in position, which corresponds to this, and this is our change in time, which corresponds to this. So then we can plug in our values into our position function, and then we can also reduce our bottom here, but that's just gonna be one. So it's just going to be this part divided by one, so we can actually just kind of ignore the denominator and continue with our calculation up here. So we're gonna have that this is equal to seven times three plus four, because that is our position function, but we're plugging in three. And then we'll be subtracting seven times two plus four. And that is just plugging two into our position function. So we can simplify, we'll have 21 plus four minus 14 plus four. And so then we're going to have 25 minus 18. So this is equal to 25 minus 18, and that's going to be equal to seven. And so that would be our average velocity over this period of time. Now, let's say that our position was measured in feet and our time was measured in seconds, then this would actually be a rate of seven feet per second, which is the units of position divided by the units of time. Next, we're gonna look at the position function two times t squared minus five, and we're gonna be finding the average velocity on the time interval from time equals one to time equals three. So we'll start this one just like we started the last one. We will have that our average velocity is equal to the change in position divided by the change in time. And this will be equal to the position at time three minus the position at time one. And this is going to be divided by our change in time, which is going to be three minus one. So I'll write that, three minus one. So now let's plug in our values into our position function. And this is going to be equal to two times three squared minus five minus two times one squared minus five. And this will be divided by two because three minus one is two. So now we can simplify. We will have two times nine, which is three squared, minus five minus two times one minus five. And this is still divided by two. We'll simplify even further and we'll have 18 minus five. So that's going to be 13 minus two minus five. So that's going to be negative three. So minus negative three would be plus three. So we'll have plus three over two, and that's going to be equal to 16 divided by two, which we know is eight. And so in this case, our average velocity from time equals one to time equals three for this position function is eight. And again, if this was measured in feet and seconds, this would be a velocity of eight feet per second. So now let's revisit that function from earlier. We had that position function of 7t plus four, but now instead of finding the average velocity, let's see if we can find the instantaneous velocity at a specific time. Remember, an average velocity tells us the average velocity between two different points in time, but the instantaneous velocity tells us the velocity at one specific point in time. And that is where the derivative comes into play here. Remember that the derivative of a position function like this one right here is going to be the velocity function. So in order to find the instantaneous velocity at a particular time, such as time equals two, we're going to first need to take the derivative of our position function. So let's do that. We're gonna have that the velocity at time t, which is equal to the derivative of the position function, is going to be equal to seven times one times t to one minus one. That would be our power rule, right? We multiply by our exponent, which is one, and then subtract one from it. So really we're just gonna be left with seven because t to the zeroth power, right? One minus one is zero. is just gonna be one, so it'd be seven times one times one. So we can say that this is just seven. And then the derivative of a constant four is going to be zero. So we would have plus zero, but we don't need to write that. So then our instantaneous velocity function is just going to be seven. So if we were to plug in two into this, right, we want to know the instantaneous velocity at time equals two. It's actually not going to change, right? If I do V of two, 
it's still going to be equal to 7 because there's no variable t in this expression. So the instantaneous velocity at any point in time is actually going to be 7. doesn't even matter that we're looking at time equals 2. So this is a fairly simple example of finding instantaneous velocity for any point in time. And if you remember, when we found the average velocity for this same function on the time interval from 2 to 3, we found that it was also 7. And that's just the nature of this degree 1 position function, right? This isn't a t squared where things get a little bit different. In this case, because it's just a power of 1 for our t in this function, no matter where we are, our velocity is going to be the same. So that's why the average velocity was equal to the instantaneous velocity in this case. And once again, I did forget to mention that if we were measuring in feet and seconds, that our instantaneous velocity here of 7 would be a rate of feet per second. So now let's revisit our other function where we had the position function for 2 times t squared minus 5. And let's find the instantaneous velocity at time equals 1, 2, and 3. So in order to do this, the first thing we need to do is take a derivative of our position function. So we will have that the velocity function is equal to the derivative of the position function, which is going to be equal to 2 times our exponent 2 times t to the power minus 1, and then plus the derivative of this constant, which we know is going to be 0. The derivative of a constant is always 0. So we can simplify, and we're going to have that this is equal to 4t. That is our velocity function for this scenario. So now let's find the instantaneous velocity at each one of these times that we are interested in. We'll start with time equals 1, and we'll have that time equals 1 for the velocity is going to be 4 times 1, which is equal to 4. And so if we were measuring in feet and seconds, this would be a rate of 4 feet per second. And then if we wanted to know the instantaneous velocity at time equals 2, we would have 4 times 2, which would equal 8 feet per second. And then for the velocity at time equals 3, we would have 4 times 3, and that would be equal to 12 feet per second. Now, if you remember, when we looked at the average velocity for this position function from time equals 1 to time equals 3, we found that it was 8 feet per second. And so if we observe what's going on right here, we see that the instantaneous velocity at the lower endpoint, time equals 1, it is less than our average velocity. And then our highest endpoint, or time equals 3, was greater than our average velocity. And then hopefully, to no surprise, our velocity at the time in between our two endpoints, which would technically be the average time between the two points, right? The average of 1, 2, and 3 would be 2. We have the same velocity. So this is actually equal to the average velocity. So I just wanted to quickly show you that and compare our average velocity to our instantaneous velocity at each of these points, because I think it's kind of interesting when you look at the same position function around the same time frame, just so you kind of see the difference between each of them. All right, so now we have a more complex example. We have that an apple falls from the top of a tree, and we are given a position function for this scenario. So we have a tree here that is 18 feet tall, and an apple starts at the top, and it's going to drop and hit the bottom. So now we have two questions that we're going to be asked about this scenario. The first one is, when will the apple hit the ground? And our second one is, what is the velocity at that time of impact? So let's start with the first one. We'll come to our second question later. And it's asking us, when will the apple hit the ground? Well, that is the same as saying, when will the position of our apple be zero, right? That would be the bottom of our diagram, right? The apple starts up here at the 18 feet mark. This is 18 feet tall, so it starts at 18 feet and we want to know when it's getting to zero feet. What time will it be when it hits the ground? So we'll do that by setting our position function equal to zero because we want to know when the position of the apple is zero. So for our first part, we're going to have zero equal to negative 9t squared minus 9t plus 18. And so now what we want to do is we want to solve for t to find the value of time when the position is zero. And now I see a common factor of negative 9 that I can pull out, so we'll start by doing that. We'll have 0 equals negative 9 times t squared plus t, and then we're going to have minus 2. Then we can factor this quantity right here. This should factor pretty nicely. So we're going to have 0 equals negative 9 times t minus 1 times t plus 2. So then we can solve for our values of t. So I'll do that up here. We're going to have 
t minus 1 equals 0 and t plus 2 equals 0. So that's going to give me t equals 1 and t equals negative 2. Now we can immediately throw out this one because time is never going to be negative. It's always going to be greater than or equal to 0 because we can't go in the past. We can't time travel. So that leaves us with just time equals 1. So now we know that the apple will hit the ground at t equals 1. So that's going to be the answer to our first question here. All right, so for our second part, we want to know what the velocity is at the time of impact. And so we already have our time of impact, t equals 1. That's when the apple hits the ground, when its position is 0. So now we just have to find our velocity function and plug in that time. And we know that the velocity function is the derivative of the position function. So we will take a derivative of this and we'll plug in our t. So we know that the velocity is equal to the derivative of the position function, which is going to be equal to negative 9 times 2 times t to the 2 minus 1 power, right? We subtract 1 from our power. That's our power rule for derivatives. And then we have minus 9 times 1 t, 1 minus 1, and then plus 0 because the derivative of a constant is 0. So then we can simplify and we're going to have negative 18 t minus 9 because t to the 0 power is just going to be 1 times 1 times negative 9 is negative 9. And then we just don't need to worry about this plus 0. It's not going to affect anything. So then this is our velocity function. So now if we plug in time equals 1 into our function, we're going to have negative 18 times 1 minus 9, and that's going to be equal to negative 18 minus 9, which is negative 27. And in this case, our rate is going to be feet per second. And that would be our answer for part number two. So when the apple hits the ground, when it is at the position of zero feet, which took one second, it's going to be moving at negative 27 feet per second, which just means it's moving downward at a speed of 27 feet per second. All right, so I do have one more example I wanna look at yet, which is a little bit different than the previous ones. All right, so here we have a bit of a different example. This can sometimes be helpful in understanding the concept of rates of change, but the real reason I am covering this is sometimes this will be thrown on an exam that you might see for this topic to kind of throw you off. And it's really trying to make sure that you understand what a rate of change is. So let's look at this. We have a function here, this red line, and it's got several points on it. And we're going to use those points to answer four different questions, one at a time. So we'll start with the first one here that asks us between what two consecutive points, meaning these points here on the graph, is the average rate of change the greatest? So let's think of that. We've been talking about average velocity and instantaneous velocity, which are rates of change. Velocity is a rate of change. We want to know where is the average rate of change the greatest? And in our lesson, we discussed how the rate of change can also be seen as slope. And so really what we're looking for is where the slope is the greatest on this function. Between what two consecutive points is the slope the greatest? greatest. And so what that means is we're looking at consecutive points, so we have to look at points that are right next to each other, like A and B, B and C, and C and D. And so let's observe each of the slopes between each of these points. So between A and B, if we were to look at the slope, we would just draw a line. I'm going to draw a dotted line between the two points and kind of observe how steep that is. And then we'll draw one between B and C. And that seems to be a little steeper than this line. And from C to D, we're actually going to have a negative slope, right? If a line is going in this way, it has a negative slope because you're going downward in the Y direction. So we don't even need to worry about these two points because that slope is going to be less than these two. So we notice that between A and B, we have one slope. We're not really sure what it is, but we can tell that it is not as steep as the slope between B and C. So we would say that the average rate of change is the greatest between B and C. So that would be the answer. We will have B and C. So then for our second question, we are asked, is the average rate of change between A and B greater than or less than the instantaneous rate of change at point A? So let's look at each of these. So the average rate of change between A and B would be this slope that we discussed earlier, but then the instantaneous rate of change at point A would just be the slope at point A. And so this is going to be a lot steeper, as you can see, than the average rate of change between A and B. And so this one should be a pretty quick and easy one to answer. And that is that the average rate of change between A and B is going to be less than the instantaneous rate of change at A. So that's going to be less than. So then our third question asks, between what two points is the average rate of change closest to zero, meaning how close does it look to a horizontal line? 
because horizontal lines would have a slope of zero and negative. So this isn't consecutive points, this is just any two points in general. So what we wanna do is we wanna look for a slope that is not steep at all. So we're not even gonna worry about between B and C, or A and B. In fact, we don't wanna worry about any slope that might be positive because we're looking for one that is close to zero and negative. So let's take a look at A and D. And so if we look at the slope here, it would be negative and it's closer to zero, meaning being a horizontal line, than any of these other points, right? If we look between A and B, well, that one's positive, we can't even look at that one. But B and D would be way more steeper and so would C and D. So out of all of our negative slopes between here, here, and here, between A and D is going to be the closest to zero. So then our answer for three would be A and D. So then finally we have our fourth question where we are asked to label a new point where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change from A to D. So you notice I kept this here. So if we look at this, where do you think that the instantaneous rate of change or the slope at one point would be the same as the slope between A and D? So all we have to do is look for a point on this function that seems to have a similar slope to this line right here. In fact, I'll even make it a little easier to tell what this slope is by just drawing a line between them. So that's about the slope there. So let's look along our function. It's definitely not gonna be all the way up here. Uh, let's see, oh, right about here seems like a good candidate. Let's keep going. There might be multiple, maybe right about here, but it's a little close to C, so I might wanna put it somewhere else, but it's definitely not gonna be down here where the slope is really negative and a lot steeper than it is right here. So I'm thinking that if we put a point right here and we looked at the slope of the tangent line at that point, it's going to be really similar or equal to the slope between A and D, the average rate of change between A and D. It's not perfect, but for a question like this, I think you get the right idea of this point would have about the same instantaneous rate of change or slope at its point that A and D have between those two points. So I will label this point E, and that would answer our question here for number four. Point E is going to have about the same instantaneous rate of change that A and D have for their average rate of change. So hopefully that makes sense. So that's all the examples I had in this video. Hopefully this last one was really helpful. I know that this can be a little confusing when you see a graph, but hopefully it was helpful. If you have some questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, but that's all I have for now. So I will see you next time. Thank you.